Hello, my name is Caroline Stokes. I'm the CEO and founder of Forward. And throughout September and October, I'm bringing together a whole bunch of very interesting, very diverse brains together to help us understand how we can evolve in this new era. I am particularly excited to bring today Enrique Rubio, who is the founder of Hacking HR Community. But I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to be asking Enrique. Enrique, great to have you here. Tell us about your community. I want to hear all about it. Thank you, Caroline, for um, for inviting me, and it's a it's a privilege to be connecting with you. My name is Enrique Rubio. I'm the founder of Hacking HR, and Hacking HR is a global learning community bringing HR leaders and practitioners, HR technologists, consultants, and people from all walks of the uh, of the people space. We're bringing them together to discuss, learn, collaborate, learn, and share about all things that are at the intersection of future of work, which is now the now of work, future of work, technology, organizations, people, innovation, transformation, and the impact of all of those things in the world and the work of HR. And we do so by organizing ourselves into different levels. We have chapters that we have created all over the world. And we also have our global team organizing uh, different different programs, the Slack channel that we have, which is the largest community in HR on Slack, which is about 7, 000, seven plus thousand people. We have our global events, which we put together many of them through the year. The our signature conference, which was in March of this year, all online. Uh, we brought about eleven thousand people. We're expecting to bring twenty thousand for the conference next year. So anyway, mm -hmm. this is the idea here: is bringing all of these people together to network, collaborate, learn, share, and build community. Amazing. Thank you. And, and and the community is really important because clearly with so much uh, change happening, people need to learn from each other very, very quickly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one, one thing that that we, we know, I think all of us may agree that this idea of best practices is, is completely dead. And it's dead because... The reality for each, even though we may all be going through a similar situation, in this case, COVID, but, you know, there may be other uh, situations that mm -hmm. may be impacting different businesses. They, these organizations are exp experiencing those things in different ways. And what that means is that the reality for each company, for their people, for their leaders is different. So while we think, and I think, there's always a baseline and a benchmark that you can be looking into I, I also think that there's there are things that only make sense for you and may not make sense for others. So there are a couple of components here that are very important for our community. Number one, we are trying to encourage the HR community to experiment more with ideas that may or may have not worked for others, but may uh, could potentially make sense for, for their own organizations. Mm -hmm. And the only way to be able to do that is when you are talking to people, your peers from all over the world, some of which have already put those ideas forward and they have some information about whether they work or not. Or maybe you are the one who has already put some of the, some of those ideas forward and you can become an expert, quote unquote, for others. So the idea mm -hmm. of community and learning from each other and collaborating from each other and connecting people from all over the world is the central piece for the work that I'm doing with Hacking HR. Mm. Wonderful. And it's so important to have that community because uh, I, I was reading something on your uh, uh, LinkedIn about the, 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 the changes HR need to go through now as, to, as to, to support business rather than being in a silo. And I thought to myself, you know, th this has been my belief for so long. And the fact that you still think that that is the case and it needs to evolve, you know, kind, kind of shocks me, you know. It, uh, well, you know, there, there are so many things that if you look at them, in the world of HR and in the world of work in general, we have been talking about those things for a long time. Mm -hmm. Maybe not us necessarily individually, but people have been talking about those things. Let me mm -hmm. give you one example of that. People who talk about purpose at work. This is not something new. This has been around for 50, 60, 70 years. Ever since Frederick Taylor came up with that idea of scientific management, somebody said, like, that's that's not right. I mean, that approach is like putting people in a box. Can we do something else? Can we... Can we have people working at work, but also finding meaning and realizing their purpose? So we have been talking about this for 50, maybe more years than that. And only recently are companies realizing how important it is for them to achieve their purpose through 
the achievement of the purpose of people in their organizations. One thing cannot be decoupled from the other. Mm. If you are able to give your people the opportunity to achieve what they want to achieve, to realize their dreams, their potential, mm. their purpose, while working for you and delivering the value, you will have achieved the holy grail of, of people and organizational potential. So these things in HR are not new. It's just that we, we just disregarded them before. And now we're thinking, hey, they were truly important. So now we got to bring them to the workplace and do something about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting that you say that because immediately, and I don't know if it's because I know that you're an ultra runner uh, <laughs> yeah. <literally> every day. <laughs> and uh, But Patagonia came to mind because they're the people, they have their purpose, but it comes very much from the CEO. And yes. the CEO, you, you, we know what, what he's been doing from a political uh, uh, stance th this, these yes. past few weeks. Uh, but everyone is behind that. And uh, the, the people that buy the products are behind that because it's all about sustainable products. Um, so, and we're way off the whole traditional uh, in interview uh, system that I have, but having this conversation with you is so awesome. Um, so one of the things that I find is that HR aren't able typically to be able to inspire the CEOs to create that kind of purpose-led um culture that combines the the uh you know that combines it it all so you know it, it i'm i'm always seeing that it usually comes from the ceo and that it trickles down but how do you think with your huge community how do you think it's possible for hr to make that change upwards to push it upwards yeah absolutely that's a great question and i i want to i'm going to try to respond that question from a way larger from a way larger uh, response, if you will. Mm -hmm. When I think about the people that have the most amount of impact on the most amount of people in the shortest amount of time in the world, of course, number one are political leaders. You know, political leaders have a credible impact on everybody in society. Mm -hmm. The second level to me is business leaders because, well, you know, they are leading large organizations and they have impact on thousands and thousands of people. Now, the third level to me, this may sound a little naive and, you know, out there, to me, it is HR. If we think about it, in most organizations, for every HR person that you have working in that organization, you have two, between 100 and 400 employees that depend on the work that that HR person is doing. So if you think about it in that way, you as an HR professional, you are impacting in one way or the other, whether positive or negatively, you are impacting the lives of anywhere between 100 and 400 people. Imagine if you do an exceptional work that in your HR function you are delivering exceptional value and exceptional services to those 100 to 400 people. So you can make their lives way better. Mm -hmm. So to me, we got to begin from the place of understanding that we are way more powerful in HR than we think. Yes, we may, we may right. be doing the transaction. We may be doing the operation. We may be doing the administration because, well, at the end of the day, every job in the world has a little bit of something that you don't like, but you got to do it either way. Mm -hmm. But if we are able to say, we are this powerful or as powerful to transform the lives of 100, 200, 300, 400 people in the, at, at work. What is it that we have to do to make sure that we are doing so? So first thing is acknowledging the power that we have. Second thing, which goes back to, to, to your question, and I, I, I always say this when people ask me, what do you think HR needs to do to remain relevant? I always mm -hmm. say the same thing. We need to learn non-HR stuff. To be able to push mm -hmm. an idea upwards, we need to do a couple of things. First of all, we need to truly understand our business and our people. And once we do that, then we are going to be able to learn the things that reside outside of the world of HR, and yet they impact our capacity to sell an idea, to prepare mm -hmm. a business case, to convince somebody up the corporate ladder for them to say, all right, this is great. I can see the cost. I can see the ROI. I can see how this is going to add value. How much does it cost? How much is going to bring back? So here's the budget. Here's the people that you need to do that. So so the, I, I can continue perhaps saying more things, but there are these two things that I think are critical to me. One, that we acknowledge the power that we have to make a change in the organization and to transform the lives of our people, our employees. And number two, that we're able to learn all of the things that are critical for our work mm -hmm. that are outside of the traditional boundaries, boundaries of HR. Those two things to me are a great 
starting point in this journey. So well said. And that takes uh, people have to be very brave to do that because mm -hmm. it's a bit like teachers right now. They're having to adapt so, so, so much to be able to be teachers now. And it's the same thing, I think, for HR in this new climate, uh, in this new era that where they have to definitely understand uh, business, the business side of things if they do not already. And to really be incredibly brave to to l learn those uh, leadership and persuasive uh, abilities. So thank you for that. That's great. Um, so I'm going to get back to the interview because honestly it's so was this great. the interview oh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so the question the question i ask is so because we, we, we could talk for hours hours and hours and hours but i want to ask you uh, what are you actually stoked about right now what i'm what i'm sorry what are you stoked about what are you excited about mm. in this new era the incredible opportunity that we have to do things differently Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to say this, you know, in the in the United States, we're going through a very, very difficult time right now with our politics. You know, it's, it's messed up. But I'm using this as an example to say that there's a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn, written in the 1960s. Thomas Kuhn said, when there's a theory that explains the phenomena of the world and there are things happening that can't be explained anymore by the theory, a crisis happens, a revolution emerges. And a new theory has to be created in order to explain the new and the old. I mm -hmm. think we are, the world right now is in crisis. And it is in crisis because our political structures, our economic systems, the, the way we relate to each other in society, we are using theories that are already obsolete. They explain the old, but they can't explain the new anymore. So I'm excited because I think we are witnessing the creation of a new world right before our eyes. And we got to decide whether we want to be part of that creation or we want to remain passive by standards, just looking at somebody else doing it. But mm -hmm. when these kind of things happen, another thing emerges, and that is that the structures of power that were benefiting from the way things were before are clinging to those theories and they don't want change to happen because they lose when change happen or mm -hmm. happens. And that's what we're seeing in the world right now. You see a lot of political structures where people are have been taking horrifying advantage of the way things were before and they don't want things to to progress to advance they don't want things to change because they lose that kind of power so i'm excited about the fact that because of the push of the younger generations because of the fact that our world and this planet is dying in front of us because of the fact that a, a virus has bring humanity to its knees you know, uh, just a tiny thing that's bring humanity has brought mm -hmm. humanity to its knees. I think we are in in the in the in a place where we know there's a crisis, but there's also change happening. And I believe that the light at the end of the tunnel, the dark tunnel that we're going through right now, the light at the end of the tunnel has to be different from the light that we left behind. It has to be brighter and it has to shine upon more and more people and hopefully everybody. The light that we left behind was shining just upon a few people. That's why we have mm -hmm. so much income uh, or you know, uh, econ economic and social inequality in the world. So the new light has to be different. And we are building that. As we speak, we are building that. That really, really excites me. It's going to take time. People want to see change faster. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to take time. And there's going to be, unfortunately, whenever a revolution emerges, there's going to be some level of discomfort, mm -hmm. some level of pain, and some level of suffering, unfortunately, in, during the transition. But I believe the end state will be much better than anything that we left behind. And I'm, I'm praying for that to happen, but I'm also working to make it happen. So that's what I'm excited about. Mm. Thank you. I am so invigorated by what you're saying and you've you've encapsulated it in, in a way that I think is, is very powerful for other people to wake up to. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, so how do individuals and how do organizations make that change? Because what you're saying is, Really big, probably scary. And as you know, there's going to be a whole bunch of people that are in denial mm. and they're just going to watch, as you said. So, you know, w with your HR hat, with your experience in, in Washington, D.C., what is it that you see uh, people as individuals and, and organizations? What do they need to do? What one step? If they're too scared right now, what one step do they need to take? One thing that I want to say is get involved. Get involved. Mm -hmm. Don't let others make the decisions for you. And when I say get involved, I mean get involved in your community association. Get involved in the conversations 
about you know, uh, public policy at your local level. Get involved in the conversations that are happening in your workplace that have, have to do with diversity, inclusion, equity, belonging. Get involved in demanding from your political leaders to do the right thing. Just pick up the phone and call them, send them an email. Get involved. Uh, I think that to me is the ultimate, the first and the last and the medium and the ultimate thing of all this process of change and transformation. People getting involved. Because what happens is, that when I see that things are not changing at the pace that I want them to change, when mm-hmm. I see that things are not changing in the direction that gives me 100% of what I want, people get discouraged. And, and that's not the way the world works. That's not the way politics and business work. I'm not always going to get 100% of what I want, but I can always make sure that the people that are leading us, the people that are our voices in politics, in government, in in business, they truly represent as much as possible the values that we hold dear uh, to to ourselves. And to do that, we need to keep them accountable. And to keep them accountable, we need to get involved. And that's what's happening right now in the United Mm -hmm. States. You know, Mm -hmm. You know, for for years, people did not get involved in the local level and politically uh, and, and politics slowly has become more not only polarized, but also more broken, if you will. The same mm-hmm. thing with work. Work became broken. Work, mm-hmm. work work is broken. I mean, just think about it now with, with the pandemic, people working from home, those same folks that are working from home, grinding every day, delivering value, those are the guys that were never allowed to work from home before because their leaders did not think that they were going to do a good job. So now these people are delivering value while hanging out with their families, while you know, in the in the comfort of their homes, they don't have to commute three, four hours a day, and they continue to do the work. So if you get involved, that means in the workplace that you go to your HR person, you bring maybe some data and you say like, hey, this company has increased their productivity and the performance by 5% during the pandemic, and yet they're all working from home. Can we do something along those lines in here? Can we can we make a change in here? That to me is perhaps getting involved in the workplace. So anyway, short answer is get involved. Very good. Advocate for yourself and lobby uh, for a better future. Thank you. Absolutely, very much. absolutely. Very and, keep people, and keep people accountable. You know, like one one thing that that I tell people, you know, when when they will vote in an election, I think I think the most selfish thing that anybody can do is think that if you're candidate or your party or your political leader is not giving you 100% of what you want, then you don't vote for that person. I think that sucks because really not even in your life, you're at home. Do you ever get 100% of what you want? If you talk to your husband, your wife, your kids, and you gotta, you gotta, you gotta compromise, you know, on the place you want to go for vacation, on the movie you want to watch in the movie theater or at home at night in Netflix, on the food that you're going to eat, you always have to achieve some level of compromise. Mm -hmm. Of course, as long as you're not sacrificing who you are and your values, that compromise is okay. So so get involved means that you won't necessarily always get what you want, but Mm -hmm. you will always have the capacity to keep the people that you're voting for, the people people that you believe in, you're always going to keep them accountable with the power of your voice. And that to me, you know, trumps basically, you know, everything else that you can, with the power of your voice and getting involved, keep everybody accountable. Just get involved. Get involved. Mm-hmm. Very good. Uh, John. When John Lewis died, uh, the whole good trouble mantra was knocking around in my mind and I decided to create this podcast series. It's just like, <laughs> I want to create good trouble. We're in this situation where we're in a new world. How can we inspire hope? How can we inspire um, the, a way to see things in a different way amidst all of the, the media that is just overwhelming? So I want to ask you, what good trouble are you creating? <laughs> you know, right now with the Hacking HR community, we're working on something that is really cool. We call it the Manifesto for the Future of HR. We are creating with a large group of people from all over the world, the our vision, not just our vision, but what we think can become the HR of the future and the organization of the future. Mm-hmm. That is, to me, good trouble for several reasons. One, it, I'm hoping that HR professionals can stop looking at traditional associations that are not um, that are not up to 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 the challenge of the 
of creating the HR of our times. They continue to cling, you know, talking about Thomas Kuhn again, they continue to cling to those old values and to, do, to that old HR. Mm. So with this manifesto for the future of HR, the trouble is we're hoping HR people see value in a different kind of HR. We are hoping to encourage the existing, but also the new generation of HR leaders to think differently about the value uh, and that they can bring to the workplace and the work they do. And at the same time, we're hoping to inspire business leaders to think differently about the value that HR can bring to them, to count on them, not just to run the administration processes mm-hmm. that they've been running in their organizations, but to truly rely on, on HR to do way more. So to me, to me, that's good trouble because when, when I when I did the first meeting of of the manifesto for the future of HR with the team, I told them, you know, nobody's giving us per- is, 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 has to give us permission to do this. We don't need permission from anybody. As simple as that. If anybody, th- there was somebody who asked, like, you know, why are we doing this? Who is going to be certifying that what we're doing is right? Hell, nobody. Why does anybody have to certify what we're doing? I mean, no, it's like, evolution. Not, not only that, is that we are taking the responsibility to put mm-hmm. something out there that nobody else is doing. Yeah. I am sure that in a couple of years from now, in three years from now, people will look back and they will say, who were the, the, the courageous people that were stepping up? And not only stepping up, just like incrementally, that they were taking the gigantic leaps of progress that we needed in the HR function. And mm-hmm. I am hoping that they look at us working in this manifesto for the future of HR. Nobody has to give us permission. We don't need to be authorized by anybody. The, 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 the summary of what we're doing here is in, in a quote that says, if not now, when, if not us, who? So that's exactly what we're doing. That's the good trouble that we're creating. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Good job. good job. It is exciting. So, you know, silly question. Why is it emotionally intelligent to do this? A lot. Because, you know, the, the best HR that we can create has to be really revolving around the the human that needs to thrive and flourish and grow at work. And to be able to do that, you need to, be able to put yourself in their shoes. Because mm-hmm. if you want to offer an opportunity for somebody to grow, think about it, what's going on in the pandemic, in times of pandemic. People have been talking about how to measure performance in times of pandemic. If you had a gr- you, you may have a great performer that is a single person that, you know, who lives alone like myself. You know, I'm single, I live alone. And, you know, I don't have kids. I don't have that responsibility. So I can be my time, uh, de- I can be dedicating my time to work. Think about the mom or the dad who is a single parent with three kids at home. Now that parent has to be homeschooling their children. Uh, their children are around all the time and this person has to work. I'm guessing, I mean, I don't know if there's any data about this yet, but my guess is that the performance of this person will be impacted by the fact that he or she is not spending all the time at, at work now mm-hmm. and the kids are not at school, but everything is happening at home. So the, tons of distractions in there. So when you think about helping people flourish, grow, develop, and succeed at work, you got to take into account that each person's reality will be different, will be impacted differently by what's going on. That, that requires a lot of emotional intelligence. And evidently, I think that the moment that you think that your role as a business leader that works with people, uh, um, at the moment that you think that that's your role in the organization, and when you think that you want to develop others and you want to help them succeed at work, you are becoming an emotionally intelligent person because you can't help them grow if you don't understand them. You can't help them grow if you don't put the human first. You can't help them grow if you don't talk to them, if you don't listen to what they're going through, if you don't offer them opportunities. That to me is foundational in all this work that we're doing. Can you see me smile? I can see you. (laughs) This is so great. Uh, It's so wonderful to hear uh, hear you or anyone to be so passionate about the the human aspect. It's... And for for the empathy to come from the organization where whereby you know this this great worker this great colleague this great team player is 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 in a different environment because the whole world is now in a different environment how are we able to help them succeed and how are we able to support them and to treat them like a human uh, rather than expecting maybe a hundred and ten percent that they they used to be able to create uh, in the traditional sense and now it's like it's eighty five but it works still great for whatever reason and And, and it's And it's okay. 
you know, and, mm. and, and, it, and it is totally okay, you know, because the world is, is messy these days, you know, and people don't have it all together. That's, that's, the, that's the nature of human. I mean, you don't like that. I mean, wh what are you going to do, right? I mean, one thing that I, that I believe has been so powerful out of this horrendous tragedy of COVID-19 is the fact that it seems to me people are becoming more human now. And mm. when they become more human, they also have the capacity to say, whoa, you know, I've been judging Caroline for, you know, coming, coming late to work, but I can understand now why, you know, because she has three kids and she, all of them are in different schools. So now she has to drive them all around uh, to go to school. But now I understand that because I'm homeschooling my three children and I can tell, you know, I can tell how complicated, uh, how complicated that can be. So mm -hmm. this, this tragedy of COVID-19 has, you know, has, has made us more human and hopefully more understanding of other humans and what they're going through at the same time. It's really sad that it took such a, such a horrible tragedy for us to realize uh, how important the humans are. But I'm hoping that we can take this lesson learned out of this experience and take it forward and never forget about it. Never, never go back to things that, the way things were before. Let's hope. Let's mm -hmm. hope. Very good. What's one thing people can take away from this call, or from this session, I should say? Maybe a couple of things. Uh, one of them is get involved. Get involved mm -hmm. in as many things as you can. Your, you know, whether it is <clears throat> your community, whether it is is your uh, organization, whether it is politics, get involved. In the United States, there are, I think there's a record of like a thousand uh, uh, leaders now, or female leaders are running for office. I wish I, you know, I, I, I would love to see Congress in the United States becoming 50, 55% female. Um, that's the makeup of our population. I mean, why, why, why not? And I think that's going to happen, actually. I, I believe that it's going to happen. So get involved. Get involved in your organization, your community politics, and be more human. You know, it's just uh, if you get involved in something, do it right. And to be able to do it right, you got to think in the human and the planet, of course. You know, don't forget about our, our you know, planet that has been so damaged by us for so many years. So I think that's, that's the takeaway from me. Enrique, it's such a pleasure having this conversation with you. You're a, a breath of inspiration. And I think we, after watching this, I think we all need a nap. And then we'll get to work. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Let's make it happen. It. Thank you so much, Enrique. Take care. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.